Chesky. I'm Vice President of Water Services for the League of Women Voters of Appleton. Um, as you know, the League of Women Voters of Appleton is nonpartisan. As an organization, we do not support or oppose candidates for public office, but we act only on those issues chosen by our membership for study and action. The League believes that participation of informed citizens is ben beneficial to the system. We encourage its members as individuals to be active in finding and supporting candidates for public office and in seeking election for public office. And so the candidate forum is in that education vein, going to have an opportunity to ask the questions, face-to-face -face answers for those questions, and then to make up your own decisions. Okay? Um, in that vein as well, the League of Women Voters of Appleton is going to have on uh, November 17th on Monday evening at 5 o'clock at Cottle Rock a program on civility. And as every day goes by, it becomes more and more critical for us to start talking about civility and uh, putting some things into action, perhaps. So I'm going to um, recommend that to you. Thank you for your interest in this forum and your support of the voting process. I also want to thank the candidates, Scott Gavin and Ron Hustler for District 3, and Matt Litterer and Jim Steineke for District 5. They are willing to run for office and serve their community, and for this, we citizens are grateful. Tonight, we hope to have some of our questions answered. I'll start with a couple of the week generic questions, and we invite you, the audience, to write any questions on these note cards, and they are at the back table, and we've got two of the members who are going to pass them out and collect them, um, and they will be reading them um, and bringing them up to me, <laughs> just like that. Um, part of what, um, why they read them is because if we get, you know, ten questions we earlier about prefer the Dodgers or the Red Sox, then we can cluster those questions together. Red Sox. Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> cluster those questions together so I don't ask the tax. Um, plus, uh, we can combine some of them, and we also do this to make sure that our wording is simple when we ask the questions. Um, we have a timekeeper. Julie Evers is here. She is going to um, uh, Time them. She's got a, her phone's oh, there. She's got paddles, oh, yeah. so we need to focus on her. So, because because she's will use them. We will have two minutes for the first question, and then after that, we'll do a minute and a half. And so everyone will have the, the same opportunity. Whoever we start asking questions with, at some point, they will be the person we end asking questions with. So that everybody has a chance. I will, however, keep. District 3 responses one after another, District 5 responses one after another, not to confuse you. Um, I don't want to assume that everybody knows if they are in District 3 or 5, so if you're wondering, I do have the maps back there at that table so you can figure out because I have a fair district question. <laughs> kind of relates to that. Um, all the questions submitted, ask and unasked, I will send electronically to the candidates and um, I'm hoping that they keep their answers brief and short, but that they can respond to those um, in a timely fashion. And then we will put those candidate guides on our website so that you can be there. Uh, so that if you weren't able to come here, you will be able to see the responses to each of those, each of those questions, as well as the um, video that the Connor Library is doing will be up on the website by next week early. Okay? So the first question. So the first question is: Please um, introduce yourselves to us. Tell us why you're running. What's important about this? Um, and we'll start with Scott. Hello, everybody. How are you tonight? I want to thank the League of the Women Voters for putting this on and the amazing crowd you're going to see as well. This is Democracy at Worth, and uh, I love it. It's great. So I'm Scott Gavin, the candidate for District 3. I live in Wilshire with my amazing wife, Trisha, and our three uh, lovely children. The kids aren't here tonight. I've babysitter for them, so that's even more funny. 
Uh, professionally, I'm a technology consultant. So I work with small to mid-sized businesses every day and make sure they do the most with the less. Um, I know that every organization worth their salt, whether they're for-profit or um, private sector, uh, are trying to do not only the most with the less, but have to uh, evolve and really adapt to survive in today's economy. And I think any organization worth their salt has to do that. So I'm really excited about this, this race. I went to school at UW Madison. I'm a lifelong political junkie. I interned for a bit at the Capitol, so I learned a little bit about how the sausage was made uh, there during that process. Um, but for me, this is a labor of love. It's a labor of love because when you meet with people uh, door to door and talk to them about their pains, their issues, their challenges, and their concerns, you learn very, very quickly that uh, most of us aren't the, the radical socialists or the neo-Nazis we made out to be. We're regular people. We want limited but functional government. Most of us in Northeast Wisconsin want limited government. We want things like good schools that are paid for, that are funded, that are respected. Uh, they're dynamic, innovative at the same time. We want to make sure that we have local control. Our municipalities and counties have proper decision-making power. But most of all, I, mean, I think you might probably agree with this, when you, when you talk to folks in their homes, which is a very intimate conversation, you learn people want decency and civility, Jackie, to your point, and it's something that is sorely lacking. But fortunately, in a race like this, where you're basically looking to represent a large neighborhood, for lack of a better kind of concept, we have to be civil. And I think that's the change I'm looking to be. I think we have to understand as Democrats, and as you know, people looking for public office, that there are certain things this district wants that might not be the same as what Madison wants. So I'm hoping we're going to somebody who's a moderate, a proud moderate, but somebody who's going to work for the residents of my area. I hope I can earn your vote uh, this evening. Thank you. I'm Representative Ron Tussler uh, from the Appleton area and uh, graduated from UW Milwaukee in 2007 with an urban education degree. Was a student teacher at Bayview High School and Bell Accelerated Middle School and went on to law school, graduated from 2010. Uh, this was my first two years as a state representative. My uh, district, District 3, uh, stretches from Wilshire to Brilliant in the North Shore of Lake Winnebago. And uh, uh, I have an office in uh, downtown Appleton. And uh, just to kind of uh, uh, rehash my uh, legislative uh, two years, I had 10 bills that were signed by Governor Walker. Nine out of 10 of those were bipartisan bills, so bills that both Democrats and Republicans thought were good ideas and wanted to see get passed. And uh, worked on quite a few local issues as well as uh, statewide issues. Uh, one thing that uh, I certainly think that uh, both Scott and I share is uh, positivity. Um, you know, I, I, my impression of Scott is that uh, he's uh, very interested in being civil. Um, I am too. I think that uh, a better way to run a campaign uh, and a better way, a better way to uh, try to represent our area and the way that uh, people act and behave here is stand positive and uh, just trying to do the very best that you can to present uh, who you are. Hi, I'm Matt Lederer, and I am running for Wisconsin State Assembly in District 5. Is the mic working? Okay, I have two people away that I feel like it's not. Okay, so um, I grew up in a thoroughly middle class life. My dad was a funeral director and small business owner. My mom was an occupational therapist in both uh, uh, elderly homes as well as in special needs schools. And uh, along with that middle class, uh, upbringing, I experienced all the ups and downs uh, that, that that has. So I've experienced a wide range of, of what it is to be middle class in Wisconsin. When I was when I was growing up, it was all about helping each other out, about reaching across the aisle. And I remember growing up with the uh, the expression that Wisconsin were so nice, even our politicians are nice. I feel like maybe we've gotten away from gotten away from that. Um, the rhetoric is nice, but when you uh, watch what's actually happening down in Madison. Perhaps it's not as nice as some would have to believe. And I think we need to get back to those values uh, in, as Wisconsinites. I went to UW Madison. I've got a zoology slash uh, pre med degree. And I went to New York Chiropractic College. And I was a chiropractor for about five years with my own small business. And then I changed trades into teaching and did that for a couple of years. And now I'm a stay at home dad. So maybe not a traditional career path, but that's that's the path where life led me. And now I guess I'm. Uh, I'm uh, maybe going to be a politician here pretty soon. Uh, so you never know what's going to come at you, but here it is. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, two things we definitely need to take care of at the state level is gerrymandering and getting money out of politics. Those are two things that I hear at the doors 
over and over. It's two things that motivated me to run, and two things that I think have bipartisan support in the public, but not bipartisan support in the legislature, and I intend to change that. Thanks. Sure. Well, well, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I was talking about that a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm really grateful that you guys took the time to come here. I, I think it's unfortunate that in today's politics, in two districts that represent roughly 120,000 people, we're only able to get you know, 30 or so in the room for uh, a forum like this. Um, so I, I don't know what that speaks to, if, if, if it speaks to people just being busy with their, their own lives and uh, not having the time, or if it just speaks to the fact that they, uh, maybe they don't think that they have a voice. So, I, I first want to start off by thanking Matt for taking the time out of his life to run. It's an incredibly difficult task, as, as I'm sure he's finding out. Um, the, the commitment is enormous. Um, it's at least a six-month commitment to go out and not have those, talk to people every day, find out uh, what their issues are, what their problems are, and what matters to them. And so I give them a lot of credit for doing that. I did it originally back in uh, 2008, then again in 2010, uh, because I was really just worried about my kids' future and uh, the way the, the economy was going, the way the uh, job market was going in the state was really concerning. So, I got involved to hopefully try to make uh, my kids' life a little bit better in Wisconsin than I got a little bit. I've been over the course of the last eight years. Uh, we've had a lot of successes and things are on the right track. Uh, we haven't been perfect. Uh, we haven't done everything exactly right, but we're doing our best. Uh, so I look forward to the questions from the crowd tonight. Uh, I look forward to the spirit of the day, but I agree with uh, which I will do in the third district as well, is that stability is important. And the only thing I'll, I'll say to Matt is that although it looks like we fight a lot, over 90% of our bills that get signed into a lot of bipartisan support. That's something that's really important to me. Thank you. Well, that will be next. Uh, so I have a couple of lead questions, and of course, what's important to the lead um, is voting and um, their districting. So would you support converting through either by statute or constitutional amendment a system whereby a nonpartisan legislative service agency or an independent citizen commission would draw legislative districts um, after each census and, and, and explain your, your answer? Oh, it's for me. We've been looking at this issue for, for quite a long time, and I know this is one of the league's uh, most important issues. I know it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, I've been studying some of the um, ways that different states do nonpartisan redistricting. There's, I haven't found one uh, other than, you know, everybody points to the Iowa model, but Iowa model seems to work for them. I'm not so certain it would work for us. Uh, Iowa's pretty homogeneous. It's, uh, low populations, not a lot of uh, bigger cities. Uh, in Wisconsin, if we tried to get to a point where we had 50-50 representation in districts throughout the state, it would be extremely difficult. You would, I mean, if you think districts look strange now, they would look even stranger later because you have fingers going into the cities to pull Democrats out. And Really, when you talk to demographers, the, the biggest problem that we're seeing is people are starting to self-select more and more. Um, liberals are tending to live in, in urban areas with, where more liberals live, but conservatives are living where more conservatives live. So it's more about people self-selecting than it's about where the lines are drawn. But if we could find a system that works that was truly nonpartisan, um, I'd be able to do it. Um, thank you for this question. This is one of the number one issues in my campaign. It's one of the number one things that motivated me to run. Um, so, yes, I would support nonpartisan districting. Absolutely. Is the Iowa model the be all and end all? I don't know. I, I know there are other systems. But the point is, we need to do something. And while Jim is saying that he's open minded, um, there was a bill written for this. It was introduced and it was killed in committee. Uh, and then he voted for a bill to pay expensive Milwaukee and Chicago attorneys 
to fight this all the way to the Supreme Court. That's the bill, that's, that's his actual position. So, he says he's open-minded to it, but unfortunately his, his actions belie his, his words. I'm telling you right now that the problem with the districts right now is that they are considered safe for every single incumbent. So that means that the incumbents play to their base, and they don't really listen too much to the people in the middle, and they certainly don't reach across the aisle all that often. As a result, we see things like this bill, in right, in right here in Allegheny County, there was a referendum supported by 72% of the population that they want nonpartisan redistricting. But still we see them filling the bill and fighting it to the Supreme Court. So, if we're going to listen to our voters, we're going to listen to our voters. And we need nonpartisan redistricting in order to do that. Thank you. Uh, well, just like Jim said, I think for the most part I agree with uh, what Jim said. Jim basically mentioned that uh, um, if it was truly nonpartisan, why not? I don't think anybody in the assembly, both the, on the Republican side and the Democrat side, is really concerned about uh, um, you know a fair fight. I think what they want is they don't want one side to have an advantage over the other, and I think that some people believe that in some districts there's an advantage, in other districts there's an advantage to the other party. So it was truly nonpartisan. I don't see any reason why not. Well, you know, one of the things that didn't kind of bother me about the last answer I heard was that here, you know, Jim's involved basically in trying to find an answer, trying to find a nonpartisan uh, position that the assembly could take by hiring staff and hiring other people that are accountants, that are statisticians, that are people that have the ability to. Uh, um, determine if there is some way that Wisconsin could do it or if have another state's found a better way. I don't like seeing him get attacked for doing research. I mean, that's what you hire people to do is do some research. So I don't know if that was a fair response, but um, I don't see anything wrong with uh, a uh, um, nonpartisan fair election. Um, and uh, I certainly would encourage that to be happy for it. Yeah, the challenge with this particular question and issue is how do you pick a fair nonpartisan organization to draw the maps? I think you look at the Supreme Court, for for instance, on the federal level, it's supposed to be a nonpartisan organization, but in reality, is it? Of course not. They're appointed by politicians who are elected. Um, in theory, I do I, I do like the Iowa model a lot. I think this we should be much more fair. I would say though, as another point of caveat on this issue, is that the parties are changing a lot right now too. So I think the districts that were drawn ten years ago and the districts that might be drawn again in two years. It's just going to be a whole new ball game going forward. Um, so my concern would be how do we pick the objective referee to draw the districts? Um, if, if that's done in a fair way, it gets buy-in from the majority of, the, of our district, the majority of the, uh, the people in the state, I would be for it. Otherwise, I'd be a little bit skeptical, frankly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim, you So one more voting question. Would you protect legislation that is crafted in support of voting access to register on the day of the election? So let me phrase that again. Protect legislation that we now have in place so that there is same day voter registration on election day. Sure, well, I feel like this is a pretty simple one too in that to me, Voting is all about just making sure that the people that are allowed to vote, that are legal to vote, that should be able to vote, get one vote, and they vote fair. I have no problem with registering the same day. I have no problem with, um, you know, any sort of system that just is fair and balanced and uh, protects everybody's right to vote. Um, I want a uh, system that's simple. I want a system that's easy. And I want a system that uh, encourages people to vote as fast as possible. So. Uh, will I continue to protect that? I don't see what Yeah, it's a pretty easy question for me as well. On this issue, I agree with Ron, frankly. Um, voting is a really important right we have. It's probably the core of our democracy. Um, so anything to make it as easy, but also you know, um, legitimate, I think, is definitely necessary. Uh, Same-day registration is great. Um, I think if you look at voting rights generally in the state, there are some issues that people in other parts of the state have that we don't necessarily have up here in Northeast Wisconsin. I think we should be sensitive to the issues that, that voters in the southeastern part of the state, for instance, might have regarding their eligibility and their availability to the polls. But in terms of same day registration in particular, I think Ron and I agree on this issue. Yeah. 
Uh, would I protect same data registration? Yes. It's simple as that. Yeah. Um, it seems they're all on the same page. Yes, same data registration makes sense. Uh, I've used it myself when I was in college. That's how I registered originally. Um, I would go maybe a step further and consider automatic registration, registration when you turn uh, 18. And I think that, yeah, as far as voting rights are concerned, we need to protect those. We need to probably expand early voting hours. We need to Whatever makes it as easy as possible. Uh, we need to make, if we're going to require IDs, we need to make obtaining those IDs and the requirements therefore uh, easier to abide by those rules. Um, and yeah, whatever makes it easier uh, while still being fair and legal is, is good by me. Thank you. Um, for question four, we're um, Dark stores, that's on the referendum I know in Allegheny County. Um, we had a, a little panel discussion about dark stores. So, and I know that there has been legislation that it was proposed last year and basically we've gone about dark, dark stores. So um, it, it deals with equity in my property taxes between businesses and uh, personal Property. So we're going to start with Mr. Letterer and then Mr. Steinke, then Mr. Gavin, and then Mr. Tussler. What is your position on dark stores? Yeah, so for those who aren't familiar, the dark stores loophole is basically allows uh, big box stores to um, decrease their property taxes and be billed as though they have a vacant building rather than an up and running building that they actually have. Um, and what that ends up doing is shifts that tax burden onto municipalities, small and medium-sized businesses, and property owners. So would I close the dark stores loophole? Yes. Um, and again, this isn't, I, I think this is a rather bipartisan thing. That bill that got pulled had bipartisan support, uh, would have passed um, until the WMC, the Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, um, did something, I don't know, but suddenly they heard about it, caught wind about it, and Bill got killed. Um, so now we're going to hold an extraordinary session, I guess, to, to look into that. Um, I believe that's what, what's coming up in that one. But yes, I would close the dark source loophole. Uh, just to correct the record, the, the bill wasn't pulled. Um, we had it on the floor of the assembly on the last day, working right up until the end of the uh, session to try to get that uh, passed, to try to find uh, consensus. We were working with our partners in the Senate. Um, when it became clear that the Senate wasn't going to be able to pass it, um, we didn't have the votes either. Uh, so, but as far as, uh, we're, we're not looking at extraordinary session. It's what, what we did was, because we didn't get to a point where we could find a piece of legislation that could pass, we put together a legislative study committee that has been working on its course this summer and fall to come up with a compromise that can pass both houses. So it's, it's, you're right, it's got support of both parties, it's got support and leadership in both houses. It's just a matter of trying to find the right language to get it done. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yeah, the dark store loophole, I think um, I'm foreclosing the loophole because ultimately, as we know, property taxes are, it's basically a pie chart. It's a fixed amount of money that everybody pays for property taxes collectively. So if we're lessening the amount of big box retailer can pay, that means more for, for you and me and everybody else in the area that is paying more. So I think it's ultimately uh, the just thing to do, the right thing to do is to close that loophole. Right away. I've remained undecided on uh, closing the dark store loophole, and the reason why is I'd really like to encourage some sort of compromise to happen. So assessment law and how basically a property is assessed is somewhat complicated, but it's somewhat of a balance. So there are advantages and disadvantages on both sides. I'd like to see an opportunity where some sort of proposal was made um, to uh, uh, give some sort of benefit or some sort of help to those big box stores as well as the uh, municipality. If you look at a lot of our big box stores in Wisconsin, a lot of them are doing real well. Best Buy seems to have uh, turned around a little bit, but online sales have really affected uh, those companies, and 
I don't want to see those businesses uh, leave Wisconsin and leave our area um, and leave a big hole um, for to either uh, rot or uh, um, maybe another business will pick up. But I am concerned about that. I don't want to hit them too hard. Um, it'd be nice to see uh, some sort of compromise where we do close the, the uh, um, drug store loophole, which I'd like to do. I think uh, logically it makes sense to close it. Um, but also uh, some sort of compromise made with uh, the big box store, big box store as well. Thank you. Um, for our next question, we are going to start with um, Mr. Steinke, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Kessler, and then Mr. Gavin. So, uh, anyone who's had the TV on <laughs> has heard the back and forth around health education. So, I think I've got a couple questions here that are on people's minds. Do you support the lawsuit to suspend the um, ACA, um, the Affordable Care <coughs> Act, and, and how do you propose addressing pre-existing conditions, since it's, everyone says they're going to save those pre-existing conditions? Yeah, we actually passed the bill in the Assembly uh, this past session to uh, protect pre-existing conditions in, in case the ACA was repealed. Um, I was, I was disappointed. I was somewhat hopeful at the beginning of the, the process when uh, they talked about comprehensive health care legislation at the federal level. I was somewhat uh, hopeful that they would come to some sort of a solution. Uh, I don't think the ACA was it. Um, I think it, it did some good in expanding some access. Uh, it obviously did nothing to control costs, which is, uh, which is a huge issue. So as the years have gone by, it's, it's clear, I don't think it's ever going to get repealed at the federal level. I mean, I, I just don't think that's going to happen. So what we've had to do at the state level is look at ways that we can um, mitigate the negative impacts of the ACA. And that's why in this past session we passed the reinsurance program uh, that has already proven to have some benefits in reducing costs for people. I think it's estimated that next year rates will go down by about 4% statewide. Up in northeast Wisconsin, and Brown County is upwards of 30 percent reduction um, next year. So it, we're starting to see the positive impacts of that, but I still think that there's more that can do to help protect the cost. Um, so everybody in this room is either either has a pre-existing condition or knows somebody who has a pre-existing condition. Uh, it was probably one of the most popular parts of the ACA that had the most broad support. So that's, an, that's a pretty easy thing to support uh, that, to, to maintain that. Um, here, the, here again, I'm going to give a little bit of pushback. Um, Wisconsin's the number one plaintiff in a, a lawsuit uh, to undermine the ACA. So we can, we can withdraw ourselves from that lawsuit and probably avoid this whole problem to begin with. You don't start a fire and then hope it doesn't get out of control and then like maybe buy a, a, a fire extinguisher later. You just don't start the fire in the first place. So I'd like to see us pull out of that lawsuit. I think the, um, the Patrick Care should have been expanded eight years ago. Um, that would have helped mitigate an awful lot of our um, costs as we've seen with every other state in the upper Midwest who did accept it. And um, you know there are probably other things that we could do to, to mitigate those costs, but, but Specifically to pre-existing conditions, yes, we need to do everything we can because um, health insurance is is absolutely necessary for those folks, and we cannot go back to a high-risk pool or any of these other junk plans that we need to propose currently. Um, let me just interject. Um, I'll pull out my teacher hat here to be good listeners and uh, keep your reactions personal and not for others. Thank you. Well, pre-existing conditions, I would like this to be one of my bills in the next two years, is to, is to ensure and guarantee that pre-existing conditions are kept in Wisconsin no matter what happens to the ACA. And it's partially because of my personal experience. So my mother died about seven weeks ago now on September 7th of uh, breast cancer. She fought cancer for 22 years. And uh, the last about five to ten years or so, my dad could have retired. He's a car salesman over at Bergstrom and Appleton. He's been there his entire career for so about 30 years. And he could have retired and spent time with my mom, but he couldn't retire because he had to keep on that health insurance. 
because she had a pre-existing condition. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a real disappointment um, that it was so difficult for them to get health insurance um, as a result of kind of the history. And, and it's, I think, part of the reason why a lot of folks believe that uh, Obamacare could be beneficial to uh, the United States. So, you know, kind of given what's happened to me and how I've seen it affect my parents um, and my father um, and kind of the last years of my mother's life, uh, she died at 58. Um, you know, I think it would mean a lot to me for that to be my brother. Yes, regarding pre-existing conditions, I would vote for any sensible plan that would keep those in place here in the state of Wisconsin. That just is common sense. I would echo everybody else on in the front of this room on that. I think generally speaking, as it comes to health care, we should all just, you know, acknowledge the fact that health care is the number one issue that people talk about. It's the number one stressor. The system is just way too complex. The system is way too costly. Access is difficult, and there is no transparency regarding individual drug prices or procedure costs. The system is broken. I think we probably all agree with that on some level up here in this room. I am for any consensus plan that comes together with bipartisan support because we've seen what happened with the ACA. The, ACC, the ACA has got to be improved upon. We've seen what happens in our society when you have 51% support, 51 support for something. It turns into basically a, a small civil war. And there's no legitimacy and there's no trust around the issue. So we need to get at least, I would hope, for two-thirds support around a health care reform package that again, lowers transparency, or increases transparency, lowers complexity, and lowers costs. But again, we need to have buy-in from a majority, a vast majority of the, uh, the state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Um, for question six, we will start with Mr. Gavin, then Mr. Tesler, Mr. Lehrer, and Mr. Steinke. Um, what role do you believe the government should play in regard to the relationship a woman has with her health care provider? And do you think reproductive health care services should be singled out for increased scrutiny for the government? And that was tied in with questions that we had regarding birth control and Planned Parenthood. Yeah, great question. This is one I put on the campaign trail as well. Um, basically, um, the conversations between doctors and, and women that have those conversations it shouldn't be between those folks alone. It shouldn't be between anybody else. The government has a very little role to play in that. This is a really nuanced issue um, when it comes to access for women's, hair, uh, women's health care, when it comes to reproductive health, when it comes to birth control. I think I'm in line with most democratic views on this issue. Um, but obviously, we live in a community that's relatively conservative socially in some ways. We live in a community that, that understands um, or respects traditional values in some ways as well. What I would say is, as a lawmaker, even though I'm a Lutheran Christian, as a lawmaker, I don't think it's my job to interfere with those conversations or those decisions, at least in the first 14 weeks of a pregnancy. But I understand this is a very raw issue, and I actually really appreciate you having these conversations on the campaign trail as well, because it's very raw and very real here in Northeast Wisconsin. Well, one of the things that's always been important to me is, uh, you know, my family has uh, been involved in the pro-life movement for my entire life, and I'm very pro-life too. Um, I believe that, uh, um, you know, a baby has rights too. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, the way I've always conceptually thought of it is, if a what's the difference between somebody outside of the womb and inside of the womb? Uh, it's location, obviously, a body part. And if we took any one of you, if we took out, you know, we eliminated arms or legs, there's no body part we could really take away from you, um, other than possibly your brain would make you a human being. So body parts, the number of body parts that you have uh, isn't a good determinant on whether you're human or not human. Uh, the location, I don't think, is a good determinant on whether you have human rights or not. Uh, if you were inside of a whale, if you were on Mars, if you were in some other place, you would be a human being. So why wouldn't you be a human being if you're within another person and another person's womb? So in my opinion, um, I do find that a person that is within someone is a human being that has those rights. And I believe that everybody's rights should be protected. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, uh, as Scott said, I think I probably fall in line with most of the um, traditionally democratic um, views on this issue. I think that as a former healthcare provider, I understand you know, basic HIPAA laws. The conversation that happened in the room with the patient stayed between me and the patient. I think it should stay that way for these conversations as well. 
As far as Planned Parenthood is going, I know that's a, a lightning rod, but my own sister, while going to graduate school, um, to be, become a, a, a NASA astrophysicist, um, couldn't afford health care. And Planned Parenthood was the only way that she got her yearly exams and her mammograms and all those other things that kept her safe and healthy. So I know it's a bit of a lightning rod, but I feel like it's, um, that's an unfair characterization of most of the services that they provide. Um, and I think that as far as, as this goes, this is one area where I'm definitely a small government person, where government should stay out of it and um, let people live their lives as they see it. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, these are, these are the, probably the most difficult topics to address as a legislator when you have the intersection of personal religious beliefs, science, um, personal choices. It, it's really difficult as a legislator to know where to draw the line uh, between personal and religious beliefs and science and, and good public policy. Uh, I'm, I'm pro-life, uh, I'll be pro-life. Um, my views on that were shaped uh, early on, but even more so when uh, my wife and I suffered a, a miscarriage uh, with our first child. Uh, we had gone to the doctor, we had heard the baby's heartbeat, we had planned for that child to be part of our lives, and then we lost it. And nobody can ever tell me, even though that child was less than 20 weeks when we miscarried, but that wasn't our baby. It was our baby. So, for me, it's, it's something uh, deeply personal. Um, Roe versus Wade is the law of the land. Um, I personally believe if, uh, when it comes to legislation that we just shouldn't have taxpayer dollars going towards uh, abortions, and I think that's probably as a legislator uh, where I draw the line as far as my personal Thank you. Um, for our next set of questions, we'll start with Mr. Tesler, Mr. Gavin. Do you support taking advantage of the federal funding to expand Medicaid and cover more people under badge of care? Well, one of the things that I'm really grateful for is how successful Medicaid has been for helping so many individuals uh, in the state of Wisconsin. I think it's been a huge resource. It's been a real benefit to a lot of people in Wisconsin. So I greatly appreciate that. Um, I probably keep it roughly around where it's at currently. Um, I think that we're covering the folks that uh, cannot afford insurance uh, because of their finances for the most part, and those folks in between, um, kind of in the middle, possibly can afford their medical, um, their health insurance. Um, it's just very financially difficult for them. And I think it's financially difficult for everyone. I mean, health insurance is just, just expensive. Yes, we should have taken the expansion. And in my view, the reason it wasn't taken was because of politics and ideology. It's a very dogmatic move, I think, by the governor. Um, again, I don't mean to be negative here, but I think that was pretty cynical for not to take it. Um, so yeah, we got to help our, help our citizens out, help out the state, definitely take that. Oh. Um, this, uh, this was the governor's decision, ultimately. Uh, he made that choice, but We've, in Wisconsin, we've really, we've got it, uh, we've got it pretty well figured out. I mean, Wisconsin now, for the first time uh, in our history, we cover uh, people under uh, the federal property limit, we cover everybody with that. Um, those above the poverty limit uh, are covered by the federal government. We're the only non-expansion state to not have a gap in health care coverage. And we removed that enrollment cap that, so that more childless adults under 100% uh, of the federal power and women have been able to receive care. We're also, I just have to say, I mean, we should be pretty proud of the health care that we have in the state. Number one in overall health care quality, number one in child wellness visits, number nine in health insurance enrollment, number 12 in health care affordability, uh, number 18 in overall health care access. We can do a little bit more on that. And top four states for health care quality improvement in rural critical access hospitals. So overall, our health care system has been good, is still good. Um, but there's always more things that we can do there to improve it. Um, 
I've been talking to a whole lot of people, quite literally thousands and thousands, uh, over the last several months. And the number one thing that I hear when I'm knocking on people's doors and, talk, and, and, and talking to them on their front porches is that healthcare is too expensive and it is not accessible right now. And a lot of those people are people who are doing everything right. They're working one job, two jobs, three jobs. And what that does is it means that they're, what that means is that they're working two to three part-time jobs that do not provide benefits, but they make too much money to qualify for Medicaid. So they fall into this gap that does exist in Wisconsin because I've talked to literally thousands of people who fall into this gap, and I know people who fall into this gap. They make too much to qualify for badger care. They don't make enough to afford regular health, private health care, and their job does not provide it. Some of those people are people where they had health care coverage, they had cancer, they lost their job, and now they fill into this gap because, because their spouse is working a part-time job it makes them too much money. If we had taken the badger care expansion, which yes, we should have taken, would have helped to fill in that gap. And that's what we see in all of the neighboring states. As Jim said, we're the only one uh, uh, state in the upper Midwest who did not take it, and we're also the only state that, says, that has those gaps left over. Thank you. Um, our next question, we'll start with Matt, or Mr. Steinke, Mr. Gavin, and Mr. Tussler. So, do you support medical and or recreational cannabis in explaining Okay, this one is the for medical. It's it's very easy for me. Um, I was already up for it, and then just recently, unfortunately, I lost my my aunt to pancreatic cancer. Historically, pancreatic cancer is one of the most painful ways to go. Fortunately for her, she lived in Minnesota, where she had access to medical cannabis. Opioids did not work for her, but the medical cannabis was as close to a miracle drug as I've ever heard of. She lived the last several months of her life uh, relatively pain-free, sleeping through the night, could even take a little drink and a little bit of bite to eat once in a while, which is unheard of when you're when, with pancreatic cancer. So that is, I, I would go as far as to say that's a moral imperative at this point. And it doesn't have to be for just um, terminal patients. I think that medical cannabis could go a long way to curbing the opioid epidemic. Because anybody who's in pain, post-surgery or whatever, needs that and then they won't even be exposed to opioids in the first place so we can curb that that initial exposure to those drugs um, recreational i think we need to be careful but there are plenty of, of other states that are doing it and so i think we should seriously look into and i would be for um, responsibly uh, legalizing regulating heavily look to other states that have done it and tweaked their laws to make them more perfect and tax it, tax it, tax it, because we see these people who, we see these states and all of a sudden they've got a whole bunch of money to pour into uh, various things like addiction services, healthcare, roads, schools. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, you could have moved on. Our answers are going to be pretty similar on this. Uh, as far as medical marijuana, I'm, We've already started down that road in Wisconsin. We uh, approved the use of CBD oil. Uh, I think that was an important first step. It, it is kind of baby steps in our state. We have to, uh, I think minds are changing in the public as far as, uh, especially medicinal marijuana, uh, recreational. I have a lot of concerns about. Uh, I talked to colleagues out in Colorado. Um, there are some good things that, you know, tax money has improved. Revenue has improved, but also the cost of government has gone up as well because there's there's more issues that come along with recreational marijuana. But uh, as far as medicinal marijuana, we've been I worked a little bit with uh, a representative on the other side of the aisle on a bill last year to try to get a to, to get the right balance so that we're it's heavily regulated. It's meant for people that have debilitating diseases, debilitating pain, terminal illnesses, things of that nature. Uh, to make sure that it doesn't just become everybody gets a prescription for it for any reason. So I think we're heading down that road uh, in large part because uh, people in the public, the minds are changing, uh, but I, I still think we have a ways to go yet. But medicinal marijuana, I think, is, is closer to recreational. I think we got to let all the other states make mistakes first before we jump in. Yeah, and for both uh, the legalization of recreational and medicinal 
uh, marijuana, I think it makes a lot of sense. My inner libertarian comes out a bit on this issue. So I don't see where government has a role uh, in prohibiting people from um, either enjoying marijuana or, or treating themselves with marijuana. I just don't see, especially when it's not addictive, to legalize alcohol and other drugs. So let's be, let's be adults about this particular issue. Uh, secondly, I would just say that you know, states are the uh, laboratories of democracy. And as Matt alluded to, Colorado has been a really useful uh, case study, as well as others, about the pros and cons of this particular issue. Most of it's very, very positive. We're seeing more revenue. Colorado is seeing more revenue, I should say. Um, but there are some issues that I would have regarding enacting, um, you know, driving under the influence. How do we measure that? How do we make sure that our roads are still safe? But if there's something proven that's scientifically uh, valid for that, I have no problem with it. Let's just uh, promote more liberty in Wisconsin. Well, I like Scott's answer. Um, you know, he's brought up a lot of points that uh, I brought up in the past, and that's, to me, my biggest concern about uh, recreational marijuana is the other wise. So about, about 500 people or so um, have died already because of OWI deaths um, from recreational use. It's about 65 a year in Colorado. So to me, I'm very concerned. One of the things I think that's most important, I don't like to be too paternalistic either. I have an inner libertarian as well. But uh, um, I do get very concerned about the loss of life. You know, someone's recreation, somebody having a good time, if we can encourage that, that's okay without risking other people's lives. But when somebody dies in an auto accident, I represent auto accidents uh, in my day job uh, in downtown Appleton. And those accidents really have significant damage to people for the rest of their lives. And, um, you know, the rare cases for every, in the state of Wisconsin in general, for every case that's a wrongful death, so like that 60, in, uh, 60 or so a year that they're seeing in Colorado, there's thousands of accidents where a person doesn't get killed. Um, so to me, I'm very concerned about our, our safety uh, on the roads if we basically have another uh, recreational, um, another way for people to get high and, and drive around in vehicles. If there was some way, like maybe an electronic car or maybe electronic driving cars or something like that, to, you know, uh, fix that issue, you know, I'd have to revisit it. But I'm pretty concerned about that. Um, another thing that I think is, oh, <laughs> okay, uh, for our next question, we're going to start with Mr. Steinke, Mr. Later, Mr. Kessler, and Mr. Gavin. I'm going to switch gears here to education, lots of education questions. So, um, what changes, if any, should be made in legislation relating to private school vouchers? And, and then in that regard, what is your position on requiring voucher schools to meet the same requirements as public schools? Um, that's a good question. We, so I think we're at a, at a point in the state where I think we've struck the right balance between the ability to, uh, for, for people to choose to have a different option for those that can't afford uh, private school on their own to, if, if the public school isn't working for them. I'm a, personally I'm a big public school advocate. My dad taught in public schools in Altosa for 30 years. I used to be a public school teacher in Appleton for 18, I think now. Um, so I, I do think we have to be careful about any future expansion of uh, school choice, just because we want to make sure that the funding stream for public education remains strong. I think right now our uh, the choice program comprises about one percent of the overall students in the state, so it's still relatively small. Um, but I think that's something that we have to keep an eye on and make sure that we're not negatively impacting public education. Um, so the question again was about specifically about vouchers. About vouchers and um, having the same requirements. Yeah. I forgot the requirement. Can I just say something about that? Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, we worked with the DPI, uh, actually worked closely with Tony Eaters on this to try to come up with a, an accountability plan that was apples to apples with uh, private uh, choice voucher schools. And we came pretty close. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get that across the line. But I do believe if, if there's ways that we can uh, make the two uh, similarly accountable, then we should be. Should we? Will they the of the question? Time it at 
Okay, um, so my concern with the voucher school program is that we actually spend more per student on voucher schools, private schools, than we do on private schools. And study after study keeps showing that we do not get better results from those schools. So that, to me, is a bad investment. Um, we are constitutionally mandated to provide public school education, not private school education. And so we should concentrate on our public schools and make our public schools as strong as we can. Um, um, and as far as those who can or cannot afford, there are plenty of grants and scholarships for private schools. And I believe it's somewhere in the 80-something the percent of people in the voucher program were already in private schools. So it's not that they cannot afford it. It's that they just want some, uh, I guess, some of that sweet state handed out cash. Um, so to me, I, my other issue is special ed funding. That's too low right now. There are no special ed requirements for the uh, private schools. So what we see sometimes is they'll have students, and I've talked to plenty of people with this situation, they'll have students come in on the voucher program, and then they are unable to handle them, and they send them right back to the public school system. Unfortunately, if they wait just long enough, they get to keep the funds and those funds don't get rerouted back to the public schools. That to me is not fair, and that to me does not make sense for a whole system. Um, so yeah, I think that as far as education goes, we need to get back to actually funding our public schools and funding them properly, and not trying to run two parallel systems. Let's take care of our public schools, and the private schools can take care of themselves. Well, to me, um, you know, I'm a urban education major. You know, I taught in the inner city at Bayview High School. To me, education funding is a big reason why I want to be in the legislature. I also served on the education committee this year. Um, and I'm really excited about what a fabulous year we've had in the state of Wisconsin for public education funding. Uh, not only did, uh, so Kimberly School District is part of our district. Kimberly School District didn't just get the most they've ever received. They got the most they've ever received, plus an additional uh, $2,782,628 um, to be specific. Roughly. Right. Right. And uh, uh, Little Shoot, which is also uh, in both of our uh, districts, uh, we share Little Shoot, uh, they received $1 million uh, extra this year, um, more than they've ever received. So it is a massive year for education in the state of Wisconsin. I'm very excited about that. When it comes to vouchers, to me, so I went to St. Matthew's Lutheran uh, here in Appleton. It's a school that closed about 10 years ago or so because they didn't have any funding. And I can tell you that that school did need some extra funding. And I'm glad to see it received, or I, uh, schools like it, it's gone, but schools like it received some extra funding so that they do a great job educating kids too. Because it's not coming from our education dollars to the public schools. We're already maxing out those public school funding. This is just money that's separate that is being uh, used to uh, um, benefit other kids that uh, whose parents choose not to use the public school system, uh, which my parents did, so I certainly respect that. I thought I had a good education, despite uh, the fact that uh, you know a lot of the teachers that uh, I grew up with uh, had very little money coming in uh, from the school. It was practically a volunteer job. But uh, regarding requirements, I think it's very important for us to have requirements, uh, and those requirements can be equal and fair with everyone, so we know whether uh, a school will succeed or fail. This is very simple. Um, we should not have any taxpayer dollars for private schools, period. That is that simple. I'm a huge proponent of public education. My dad was a public school teacher. Uh, I grew up in a town of 1,500 people in the western part of the city. My dad taught and was an agriculture teacher, grew up on a farm. My mom stayed at home with my brother and myself. We didn't have the most money, but we had an amazing uh, family experience, a great community that rallied around churches, around schools, around the community at large. And it was a middle class in Wisconsin, the cornerstone of our middle class in this state, which has been, it's Wisconsin, the middle class is Wisconsin. The cornerstone of the state is, is our public education. So um, I'll be very simple on that one. I would say, I don't know if we're going to have time later on to talk about Act 10 or not, I guess I'll save my answer for that for later. But we, we can't mess around with public education whatsoever. If we, if we have parts of the state that are not um, performing like they are in Kimberly and Littleshire, Kimberly and Littleshire are two phenomenal school districts, they're two of the best in the country. They're amazing. You don't need choice up here like they do possibly in the southeast or the city. Maybe in Milwaukee, Racine, Kenosha, etc. I think it's our duty not to provide money, taxpayer money, 
for uh, private schools, but rather to redouble our efforts to improve the quality and um, I guess just the content of what's going on in the public schools. So again, let's focus on public schools. That's what our job is as a state. Thank you. For our next question, we will start with Mr. Gavin, Mr. Dussler, Mr. Later, and Mr. Steinegi. Um, this is about our environment. Um, how will you work to ensure protection of groundwater in Wisconsin and then elaborate on in terms of how do you think our state should be addressing some of the climate issues? So environment, very important issue. Probably the third most important after healthcare and education when I'm talking to voters in the trail. Um, number one, water is life. Is there any McGee in the room? Yeah, water is life. It's the most important thing we, we, we can do is to make sure our water is clean. And it's a pretty well known fact at this point that CAFOs, factory farms, throughout Kevin County, throughout other rural parts of the state, um, are, are harming our water source here in the state. If you look at Fox County, that agreement is going to harm some of the water in the, that our state is seeing. So I think, in terms of being a champion for the environment, that's something we should, we should all aim to be. I mean, we're here for a finite amount of time on this earth. I mean, what are we leaving to our children and grandchildren? We're leaving um, our environment, our water, our air, our lands. So let's redouble our efforts on that. Um, that's where we're going to leave it for now. Um, that's where we're going to leave it for now. But I think water is life, and let's just be respectful of the fact that we're only here for a small part of the time. We're custodians of this land. Let's be, let's be cognizant of that. Uh, so this year I served on both the educator, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Environment Forestry Committee and Natural Resources in Sport and Heritage. I did a lot of work regarding the, the environment. Uh, particularly because it's something that's very important to me and very important to kind of my family's heritage. So my great-grandfather was Gordon Bubaltz. He was a Republican state senator that uh, helped set aside state parks in Northeast Wisconsin. Uh, one of those parks is High Cliff, which is in our district. Heck Rod is also on the list. Um, and then the Center Swamp. He named it the Center Swamp because it was in the township of Center and it was a swamp. So why wouldn't you call it the Center Swamp? Well, nobody wanted to go to the swamp. Uh, on their Saturday, so they renamed it after him, the work of Walt's Nature Preserve. Uh, so that's kind of one of the things that people remember him the most for, not just his insurance company, Secura. But, uh, um, so that's kind of his legacy, and it's something that's really important to me, too. We had 188,000 people coming to High Cliff, I think it was 2016 was that number, and that's a lot of people that were able to enjoy that particular park, just because of his hard work in making that, uh, and setting that aside. That's why I was proud of being a legislator of the year this year by the, uh, or from the state parks um, for my bill that gave four and a half million dollars uh, to improve their water infrastructure. Uh, so what that meant is in the real world is different parks have different needs. So Devil's Lake, uh, which is our most popular park, 51% uh, of all the people that go to state parks uh, go to Devil's Lake. Uh, they needed uh, water to fix their septic system so that it didn't leak into their water supply. Uh, High Cliff in our district uh, um, received $800,000 to uh, put in a uh, um, uh, bubble system. <laughs> okay, the environment is something, we have a long storied and proud history of environmentalism here in Wisconsin from all the Leopold to John Muir to any other number of people. Um, and so I think it's something that we need to get back to, is get back to those roots of environmentalism. Uh, you know, anything from hunting and fishing to camping to just being safe and healthy and, and not having to worry about air quality, water quality, and all these other issues. The first thing I would do uh, would be to return scientists to the DNR and then give them teeth to actually enforce those rules. That makes no sense. That's what the DNR is supposed to be, is scientists uh, informing the legislature. And now we don't have those scientists to inform us. Um, I think that we should be very careful and, and maintain our ability to uh, regulate high capacity wells. And we should be protecting our weapons. There's a weapon right across the street from me that's preventing um, uh, my yards from flooding, if Jim's built, had been successful, unfortunately, that could have been filled in and uh, our whole subdivision would be under threat because they would have been able to fill in up to one acre of wetlands and that six acre wetlands was broken into six different um, lots. So that's not something that makes a whole lot of sense to me. And I would also like to throw in a little, um, a little pitch for not letting the back 40 mine go through. I know that's technically in Michigan, but we need to do what we can to, to stop that. 
Uh, so unfortunately, I think that's a little too important on what my bill actually does. My bill actually protects high quality wetlands. So the only thing it does is it impacts some of the lower quality wetlands. We define high quality wetlands in the bill. Really what the overall goal of the bill is to do, to do is to incentivize development in and around urbanizing areas to ensure that some of those more recreational areas, some of the wetlands, some of the uh, you know, natural beauty that we have in the state are more protected by increasing densities of development in the state. Um, so environmentally, it's very important to me. One of my first bill coming out of, uh, when I first got into the legislature was a sporting heritage bill. Obviously, if you're uh, a sportsman, you need a good environment. Uh, you need to be able to go out into the woods and find deer and go to the lakes and uh, fish and eat the fish that come out of the lakes. So that's, that's important, uh, I think, to all of us. And, and the tradition of Wisconsin is, is one that I think we're all proud of. Indulgence. I have two more questions, and then I'll finish out um, the set of rounds here. So this next set will be Mr. Tussler, Mr. Gavin, Mr. Steinke, and Mr. Lehrer. Many undocumented people work on our dairy farms, in our restaurants, um, and clean our offices and homes. Would you support some form of a driver card, not an official license, so they could legally drive to work, medical appointments, shopping, all the other things that to be done. Not a particular issue I've spent uh, a ton of time on, but uh, you know, to me, I certainly would rather have individuals have, I mean, I, as a driver, I would rather know that, that individuals that don't have a, um, that haven't received any training are off the road. So if requiring some sort of requirements before they start driving like I would like they would if they were sixteen in this in the state, to me certainly seemed logical and I wouldn't say I have any uh, issue with that. Uh, when I was at the DA's office in the Arden in the Arden County District Attorney's Office, one of the things that I saw that really bothered me is how often there were people that had you know, their seventh, their eighth, or tenth, or eleventh, uh, driving without a license. So they continued to drive even though they uh, um, didn't have a driver's license and they were charged as a misdemeanor on that particular, for that particular charge. I felt that while driving is very important, um, I didn't quite think that that uh, should really be charged as a misdemeanor. Um, so what I'd like to see is I'd like to see us um, certainly uh, get some sort of training for individuals that are driving on the roads, no matter whether they're documented or not, and uh, not be too harsh on folks that uh, don't have a driver's license uh, and board or person to get a license to have charge of the This was a wonderful question, a very well phrased question. I like it. Um, yeah, I'm for, I'm for some kind of documentation, um, because we need these people here. It's a thing. It's a really important thing that we're seeing right now is that there's just not workers for a lot of the jobs that are really necessary in our society. You know, the caregivers, you will get farm workers, as you as I mentioned, Jackie. Um, you know, our economy in Wisconsin and America is always dependent upon immigrant labor to do the jobs that, you know, white folks don't want to do. <laughs> and, and, and right now, the economy, the way we have it, unemployment is incredibly low. We could do a lot more for the middle class, and I'll mention that later. But the economy is great from an unemployment perspective. So we gotta make sure that we have people that do the jobs, that wanna come here in the community in a safe way, um, that want to come here and build a life, and really start their American dream, and start to build a life for themselves and their families. So I think, yeah, having some documentation for those folks when they're on the road um, makes a lot of sense, yes. Well, I appreciate Scott's endorsement of Wisconsin County. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. Um, so what I would really prefer is that the federal government, uh, people on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans alike, stop using this as a political issue and just have something done on a comprehensive immigration reform bill. It is beyond time. We need, as Scott said, we need more legal immigrants here in the state and in the country. Our population is aging, it's aging quickly, especially here in the state of Wisconsin. We need to have more bodies coming in, not less. We do need to make sure that it's done legally. I, I don't know if I would support 
uh, a driver's license for people that came in here illegally, but I think what we need to do with that comprehensive immigration reform is put those folks that are here illegally on a path to citizenship so they can come out of the shadows. So at that time, we could maybe look at something as far as driver's licenses, but we really need to do something to fix this broken immigration system because there are far too many people that want to come here. They want to come here legally, but our system just doesn't allow them because the, the cap on uh, uh, work visas is just too low. So yeah, I, I agree with, it seems like, like Jim said, this is a truly bipartisan issue. Um, we, need, we need to have workers here and the, um, we need workers in the farms or our, our small farms, our medium-sized farms will, will collapse and, and we're already seeing some of that and we need to prevent that as much as possible. As far as the folks who are here, I think that some training is good, but also I, I spoke to a couple of different um, uh, Republican sheriff's uh, candidates at the time um, and they were saying that we need these folks to feel safe approaching law enforcement. If they have a, a driver's license or driver's permit or I forget the phrasing, if they get in an accident, they're not gonna they're not so inclined to take off because they're scared that they're gonna get shipped out. If they get into an accident, they 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 should be able to uh, also apply for insurance, I would say. So that if they get into an accident, everybody's covered, um, which Rob can probably talk to a bit too better than I can. Um, so yeah, as far as that's concerned, I think we need training and I think we need these people to feel safe and we do need folks here to do the work. And so immigration reform, but that's above our pay grade. Thank you. I have lots of other great questions here, but I'm gonna go with one more because of our timing. So this is the last question. We'll start with Mr. Lager, Mr. Steinke, Mr. Gavin, and Mr. Tuster from last today. So um, what is your position on gun violence prevention, background checks, any other good ideas on how we can solve this issue? Okay, gun violence. Um, yeah, certainly we all know that this is a huge issue. It's top of mind for a lot of people, especially people who have kids in schools right now. Um, for me, there are some things that we can do that both preserves the rights of gun owners and preserves the rights of all citizens to be safe. Um, so, uh, universal background checks, this is something that is supported by 70 to 90% of the population, including gun owners. I know that there was a bill introduced, it, it died in the committee. Um, um, I know banning bump stops is another thing with almost universal support. For some reason, that hasn't happened yet. I think a 48-hour waiting period, or a cooling-off period, as they call it, it's a small inconvenience, um, but it will prevent an awful lot of domestic violence or um, heat of the moment type issues. Uh, red flag laws for those who are in danger for themselves or others is something that makes sense for those who might be experiencing some sort of um, mental health issue where their friends or, or friend family will, will know that, that this is dangerous for them to receive a gun. And um, I think that at least those four things are things where, again, it's got in the public, by and large, huge bipartisan support. And so I, 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 would, I would be a proponent of getting those things done. This is a really difficult issue because you're talking about uh, the balance between people's constitutional rights and the safety of the public. So uh, in, the, in this last session, uh, the State Assembly uh, voted to expand uh, background checks, which I think is a, is a step in the right direction. But I think where we really need to start, I think we'll never solve this issue completely until we really address the mental health crisis that's going on in this country. I mean, that is the number one driver uh, of the problems that we're having. We, uh, we've been doing what we can uh, in the state legislature over the first and last few years. The, the speaker and I have created a task force on mental health, uh, toured around the state over the course of several months and, and came together and, and passed a broad bipartisan package of reforms uh, for mental health that at the, at the time were called uh, the biggest reforms in mental health care in the, in the state and uh, in memory. One of my bills was, as part of that package, was uh, a child psychiatric hotline where uh, pediatricians that are often the, uh, the 
first people to triage kids who are having these mental health issues um, can access this telephone psychiatric line uh, to get help uh, dealing with their uh, pediatric patients. So things like that, dealing with mental health is, is really number one. As far as bump stocks go, we looked at that. You can create a bump stock with a rubber band, so I'm not sure how, how much uh, that would change anything. And then doing a temporary restraining order uh, for people that have A really uh, great question, a very interesting uh, topic to discuss. I would be for a 48 hour waiting period, uh, as Matt mentioned, and also for universal background checks. These are common sense uh, reforms we can make to kind of uh, find some consensus on this issue to support by most people nationwide, certainly statewide as well. I will say, though, when it comes to, to gun rights in general, most of the crimes and the horror stories we read about in the newspaper are not, not um, conducted by people that um, love gun culture here in Northeastern Wisconsin. They're not done by our hunters. They're not done by people that um, really revere the safety and you know, making sure that guns are handled properly by, by family members and that sort of thing. I think, to a large degree, I agree with Jim on this. It's a major mental health issue. I really think it is. If you look at young men in particular, uh, young boys, 12 to 20 years old, that's where these tragedies are coming from. Why can't these young men and boys handle their anger in a proper way? Why don't they take out their stress in a way that it's a healthier way instead of deciding to light up um, their classrooms in some cases? Um, the other thing, we see a lot of violence in urban communities, um, low uh, income poverty rated communities. It's high crime. That's where you see violence. I mean, that's not rocket science. So I think if you want to really limit the amount of violence we see and the horrible news stories we read about, let's, let's take a look at um, high, high crime areas, obviously, and then mental health for young men, especially. All right, well, I'm excited because I thought for sure somebody had already covered my uh, point before it got to me. Uh, so, me and plus, uh, whoever gave this question, I was hoping I could talk about kind of, I think, one of the most exciting bills we had this year was $100 million that we gave our individual school districts to improve their safety within that particular school. So, I sat on education committee, and one of the things that was presented to me that I was just so impressed with is all the different things that you can do to a school to make it more safe for gun violence just physically. Now it seems like, well, what could you possibly do? These guns are, you know, some of these things in here. Yeah, you can be caught by the library. The time is now. You can lock, uh, 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 you can lock yeah, down different doors, doors, you can get the paper molds, you can all the different things. You can basically localize the problem so that the numbers that you have would be minimal, um, if non-existent. And that $100 million, I think, could really save some lives if something like this does happen in Wisconsin. So I thought it was a really good uh, use of uh, um, uh, that uh, special session that uh, Governor Walker called. And uh, really, I mean, this is something that we saw in a lot of our districts here. Uh, Kimberly applied for it and received it. And I believe Will should did too. Um, some additional funding uh, to try to make the school safe. So to me, I thought this was kind of a common sense thing we should have done a long time ago. Um, I'm glad we did this session. Do you think teachers should have guns? Mm -hmm. We're um, wrapping up now. Who wants to know whether or not <laughs> Rod asked teachers should have guns? So, no? first of all, I think they should be able to own guns. In the classroom. No. First of all, Good. I would Good. like to thank the candidates. Until this point, they've been challenging. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. I really did. I'm sorry. Thank you, 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 I need to thank members of the League who helped make this uh, forum happen. Julie, timing, did it make you crazy? <laughs> um, Cindy and Marsha and Elizabeth and Penny for uh, dealing with the cars and all of those kinds of things. I have to thank uh, James Berlin from the Kokoda 